to me today. Um, I am very happy to have a wonderful panel here with whom we can discuss the transboundary challenges um, that are out there when addressing climate change and how to best address them, ideally with the help and support and engagement of the many river basin organizations that are already out there, already working on water management and now being more and more engaged in also addressing the climate change challenges. Um, our panel here uh, includes, um, if I could start uh, from the end, I think, Oswald Chanda, Division Manager at the uh, African Development Bank and uh, a leader in uh, water sanitation and water management issues. Um, and we also have Jonathan Barnes, who is there. Um, he is with uh, Kritf. Exactly, Kritf. And he will tell us a little bit later what Kritf actually is and does, but it does provide and mobilize financing in the context of transboundary um, water management. We also have uh, Sarah Tuzi with us, who is with the um, Global Water Partnership of the Mediterranean region. And to that end, we'll be able to tell us a little bit more about the challenges that the uh, Northern Western um, Sahara Aquifier um, uh, basin management uh, has and how this is being addressed. And uh, we have uh, Abdel Guero over there, um, technical director with the Niger Basin Authority. Um, after we will hear from them, uh, we will get technical interventions and questions from a couple of organizations that will help us think through the challenges. Specifically from UNECE, we have Sonia Köppel with us, but also from the International Network of Basin Organizations, uh, Edouard Bournet is with us. Yep. Where? There we go. Edouard is standing there. And uh, Greg Browder from the um, World Bank. Where's Greg? Here. Um, now, you will see that we have some of us up here and some there, and that has to do with the really interesting fact that we've got a set of presentations up there, and kind of some of us may have to do something with their necks. But before we all get into this, um, our colleagues from Niger will show us a little film to inspire us all and get us in the right mood. So if I can ask for the film to roll now, and the rest of us here gets to twist our necks. Actions prioritaires est évalué à 3,11 milliards de dollars américains, 
sur une période de 10 ans. Le BIC constitue le plan thématique humain du plan opérationnel décennal de l'APN, dont le montant total est de 7,2 milliards de dollars américains. Le plan d'investissement a été lancé à la COP21 le 2 décembre 2015 à Paris en France. Pour le bonheur des 160 millions de personnes qui vivent dans le bassin du Niger et avec le soutien des partenaires techniques et financiers, trois grands programmes ont vu le jour et seront tous mis en œuvre à partir du début 2019. Il s'agit du programme intégré de développement et d'adaptation au changement climatique dans le bassin du Niger, PIDA, financé par la Banque africaine de développement, le Fonds vert climat, l'Union européenne, le Fonds pour l'environnement mondial, l'Allemagne, les États membres de l'ADN et les populations bénéficiaires pour un montant total de 232 millions de dollars américains. Ce programme, approuvé par le Conseil d'administration de la PAT, chef de file, sera lancé en mars 2019. Du programme de développement de la résilience au changement climatique dans le bassin du Niger, financé par la Banque mondiale pour un montant total indicatif de 500 millions de dollars, dont la première de 66 millions de dollars et la préparation des phases 2 et 3 seront lancées en 2019 du projet d'amélioration de la gire et de la gouvernance fondée sur la connaissance du bassin du Niger et des systèmes aquifères et le BD, la Oudéni, la Nuzou et Invitas financé par le Fonds pour l'environnement mondial, le PNU, le PNU2, l'ONUTI, l'ADN et l'OSS pour un montant de 13,7 millions de dollars. Les accords de financement sont signés et le projet démarrera en janvier 2019. D'autres projets non moins importants sont en cours d'exécution dans le projet de suivi des ressources en eau et de prévision des écoulements par satellite financé par les Pays-Bas, la Banque Afrique de Développement et l'AB1 pour environ 6 millions d'euros. Le montant total de financement mobilisé et en cours de mobilisation est de 795 millions de dollars américains, soit 26,6% du montant du PIC. L'AB1 appelle à la solidarité de la communauté internationale pour mobiliser le cap du financement nécessaire à la mise en œuvre effective du plan d'investissement climat du bassin du Niger pour le bonheur des populations. Ensemble, pour le développement du bassin du Niger. So thank you, first of all, to the Niger River Basin Authority to sharing, and to the Africa Development Bank to sharing that introduction with us. And um, in uh, beginning our dialogue, let me also introduce myself. I am Monica Weber-Farr. I'm the Executive Secretary of the Global Water Partnership. And as such, we work with uh, river basin organizations around the world. In fact, we've helped, in many cases, give birth to some of them, which was a, a beautiful uh, midwifery activity um, that uh, we're still very much engaged in. Um, we also are being live streamed. Just wanted to make sure everybody knows this. And as we're getting questions later, we may bring some of those questions from the outside in here. And there's a team down there that will pass on these questions. So without much further ado, if I would ask uh, Oswald Chanda, Division Manager with the Africa Development Bank, to kick us off, please. Um, here, there, what would you like to do? Just kick us off, give us some provocative thoughts so that we can go deep into the substance matter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Monica. And uh, indeed, I think the video clip has provoked us quite a bit uh, into uh, what we are going to discuss uh, this uh, morning and afternoon. And I think in further uh, trying to make us think a lot more about how shall we engender action in transboundary water resources, I would like to just bring out a few provocative uh, uh, statements and questions uh, to us. In around these four corners uh, of this room, we would all agree that water resources management is a cornerstone of adaptation you know, for climate change. But in the environments in which we are operating, let's begin at the basin level. Let's begin at the country level. How many other people, the ministries of finance, the different actors, the communities, uh, uh, the financiers, how many other people agree and would bear witness with us and say, yes, indeed, water resources management is uh, key to um, climate change uh, climate resilience, building climate resilience and, and adaptation. 
we do have a, a big challenge in terms of our selling points uh, for us to engender the action that we need to build uh, this resilience. On the continent of Africa, we have about 64% uh, of the rivers are transboundary uh, rivers. And quite often we get quite excited when uh, frameworks are developed, uh, policies, protocols are developed and agreed upon, but how much of that is translated into national legislation, is translated into basin action plans so that we can get the action that is needed. The challenges besides governance abound. Issues of capacity, issues of information, uh, and information sharing, information capturing and information sharing uh, 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 abound. So, transboundary organizations play a key role. Transboundary organizations should go a whole lot further beyond the frameworks, beyond the protocols to drill down to the uh, basins, to the communities, to ensure that action plans in include the elements that are in the frameworks, that are in the uh, protocols. We have some uh, uh, tailwinds that have helped in ensuring that this agenda is uh, further pushed on. The SDGs, you know, in particular, the SDG uh, 6.5, you know, helping us to make these countries move a whole lot more towards integrated water resources uh, management and ensuring that transboundary cooperation, transboundary uh, action is uh, being given the priority and the resources that are required uh, uh, to, to, to get us uh, the results and to build that resilience that we need. We also have, uh, for example, the Water Convention. You know, many uh, of the basins that have been struggling with coming up with the, their own agreements, with their own framework, using it as a basis, you know, uh, uh, for understanding, for better uh, crafting of frameworks that uh, will uh, help in engendering action uh, on the basis, uh, on the, on, in the basins, and ensuring that we do have a, a, a resilient basin that is going to stand the shocks of climate change. But of course, on the continent, we all know the challenges of population increase. We all know the low infrastructure levels to build this uh, 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 resilience. We all know the challenges of capacity among uh, uh, the, the institutions, among even the transboundary river basins that uh, 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 are managing these, uh, our resources. What are we doing? What can we do? to ensure that we address all these elements. And the last, of course, the financing aspect. Until we have raised sufficient awareness, until we have got the Ministry of Finance when they are asked what are the challenges, what is the number one priority in building uh, adaptation and climate change resilience, and if they are asked three of those, they talk about what resources management, we will have uh, been failing in our assignments. On our part, working with the World Bank indeed and other organizations, we have put our heads together to prepare some uh, information that is going to help in at least the preparation of projects. We know the challenges of project preparation, particularly at transboundary uh, uh, basin level, you know, uh, uh, getting all the countries uh, uh, cooperating. We have put up a document, we have put up a tool that is going to help in uh, preparation uh, of documents in cooperation between the different uh, nations, between the different uh, partners to ensure that uh, we get the projects rolling out, we get the action that we need to build uh, the resilience to climate change. Many of these areas that I've talked about, colleagues here will go into some detail and I would like to maybe just uh, close it here and say that um, let us all be provoked to action. The challenges are much deeper. Uh, if you think there are challenges in water resources management at national level, at transboundary level, it's even uh, a, a greater dimension. 
I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very, very much, Uswa. Uh, so, working in the transboundary context is a little bit like water resource management on steroids. Everything that's difficult already gets more difficult. Um, let's hear from Jonathan um, how you see the challenges out there and what you're proposing can be done about them. Do you want to have this? And this here can click your right. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm delighted to be here today on behalf of CRIDIF. And I would just like to give my thanks to the African Development Bank for giving CRIDIF the opportunity to present today. And the key presentation point that I'm going to be talking about is really mobilizing private sector finance for infrastructure in a transboundary river basin. And I'm going to look at an exact example of what CRIDIF has done in the Imkamati River Basin. Now, I had the role of, of project director on this project for the last four to five years. Now, first of all, who are CRIDIF? Now, CRIDIF is the Climate Resilient Infrastructure Development Facility. And we're DFID funded, so we're funded by the UK government's Department of International Development. We're a UK aid program. And CRIDIF has been in operation since 2013 and is planning to be so until at least 2020. We facilitate long-term solutions to water infrastructure in mainland Southern Africa. So we work through partnerships. So we work with the Southern African development community. We work with river basin organizations. We also work with member states. We work with our international cooperating partners, including, of course, the African Development Bank. We also have three main aspects to our mandate. First of all, we're pro-poor. So all the work we do has to really have an impact on the poorest communities in Southern Africa. The second thing we need to look at is the transboundary context. CRIDIF works in the river basin organizations in Southern Africa. So it's all the transboundary river basins. Thirdly, we're climate resilient. So everything we do in terms of our water infrastructure development, our technical assistance, the projects we do, we have to build in climate resilience into that. So those are the key points. We also have a gender focus as well, which is important to note. We are a, um, we've got three main work streams. So we have our stakeholder influencing engagement team. We have a mobilizing finance team. So if we have a, a relatively small scale project, CRIDIF can fund that. But if it needs to be expanded, or we need to look at innovative financing approaches, we bring our mobilizing finance team to help support that. We also have our infrastructure preparation team. And this is basically where CRIDIF is the one-stop shop. So we actually um, go from pre-feasibility to feasibility to detailed design on civil engineering, water infrastructure projects. We then go into the procurement stage, working with our various clients. And on the smaller scale projects, CRIDIF will actually invest the money for the capital expenditure for the construction stage. On the larger scale projects, we bring in our other partners. So that's basically what we, what we do. Now, in terms of what we've done on the Imkamati, project, I think it's important to note here that I want to focus again on how we support transboundary actions to address climate change and how we can mobilize a private sector to help invest. So first of all, this, this map here really gives you the, um, the indication of where we operate. This is the whole of Southern Africa you can see here and it shows the different transboundary river basins and the different countries in which CRIDIF works in. Um, during our first phase of CRIDIF, we implemented 40 projects over 11 different countries. Now, this little orange blob you can see there is the Umkamati River Basin. It may seem small in this map, but it's still of significant size within the Southern African continent. So I'm going to give some information on the 
on the river basin. So this is the zoomed in map of the area. And as you can see, what actually happens is water flows from the west, from South Africa, and it goes east into Mozambique. The gray area to the east is really where the main floodplain is in Mozambique, where you get most of the flooding occurring. You've also got the Mkamati River, which flows through the new country of Eswatini, which used to be called Swaziland. So you've got the Mkamati River, the Crocodile River, all flowing west, then going into, the, um, into Mozambique and then through to the Indian Ocean. Some other key information for you is the Mkamati River Basin is about 47,000 square kilometers. So effectively, in European terms, it's larger than Belgium, it's larger than Holland, it's about half the size of Scotland. You've got over 500,000 people living in the Mozambique portion of the Mkamati River, and you've got a high demand for water. And this is where the interesting part comes in, is if you look at that gray area on the map, there's a black blob and there's a red one. Now, the black area is actually where Tonga Hewlett work. Now, Tonga Hewlett is one of the biggest multinational sugarcane producers in southern Africa. And just below that, about 60 kilometers to the south, you have Elovo Sugar, who are also one of the biggest multinational sugarcane producers in southern Africa. Now, they are competing users, but they have altogether about 15,000 employers or employees. So they are the largest private sector employers in Mozambique in the Mkamati. Um, outside of the sugar estates, you have the outgrowers. And the outgrowers are the small scale sugarcane producers. Now, it's in the sugar estates or the large sugar um, estate producers' best interest to look after the outgrowers because the outgrowers actually they grow the sugar cane and then they need to get it processed at the mills that both Elovo and Tonga Hewlett have. And Tonga and Elovo make money out of it and the small scale outgrowers make money out of it as well. There were major floods in um, 2000 as well. Most of the population is below $2 a day and 50% of the income is from farming. Now, Elovo approached Critif to actually produce this, um, to say, you know, can Critif help resolve some of the flooding issues? So what Critif did is we came up with a whole plan. So we looked at um, three phases. We had phase one, which is looking at flood risk management in the lower room Kamati, just focusing on the flood management infrastructure required. We then also looked at phase two, which is establishing an early warning flood forecast system for the entire river basin. And thirdly, we looked at flood mitigation through large storage infrastructure. I won't go into that at the moment, and I'll focus on the rest of it. So importantly, and, and this is very important here, is looking at what are the climate change adaptation strategy findings within the Mkamati Basin. And this helps us to design the project. So first of all, in the future, from the findings of this recent study, which has been completed by climate scientists and engineers, the mean annual rainfall is likely to increase by about 20 to 40 percent in the medium to long term. So that's within the next 30 to 80 years. We're going to have a decrease in rainfall concentration, which indicates a longer rainfall season. Other things we're looking at is in terms of temperature, it is likely that the temperature in the region is going to increase by a minimum, on average, of about three degrees centigrade within the next 80 years. So what does this actually mean in terms of evaporation? It means we're going to have eight to 25% increase in the medium to long term. And if you take that information and you look at it in terms of how it's going to impact the rivers and the water resource management and the flooding, these are the facts. You're going to have more frequent flooding. You're going to have extended rainfall seasons, which can, in a positive way, give more inflows to the dams and greater potential for water storage. We've also, as part of this project, and I just want to touch on this, is we've now created an early warning flood forecast system for the entire river basin. 
And uh, by doing so, we've proved the economic benefits of this. We've worked with the transboundary stakeholders to, to make it work, and we've had to do a lot of lobbying to make this happen. Now, I'd like to just quickly focus on the lower part of the Imkamati River. And basically, the two sugar estates were in competition with each other. So Elova at the bottom here, they were building up their flood defences, and what that meant was it actually flooded the upstream area. When Tongit Hewlett found out about that, they built their flooded defences up, and it flooded the downstream area. Then Elova did the same thing, and you're at this never-ending cycle. So what Critif did is we came in to work out part of the risks is how can you get the sugar estates to work from competition to collaboration? How do you get the government organizations to work together with limited funding. And by doing that, how can you have a holistic approach to flood risk management, changing from flood avoidance? So we managed to do this working with our partners, creating a public-private partnership. So just very, very quickly, I'm going to say these are the structures that we created. So we had Arasol, the Mozambican organization, um, working at the as the client, we had Alova and Tonga as the stakeholders. We sold the benefits to the decision makers, so it's the director generals of the companies, the managing directors, explaining to them they needed to change their approach to flood risk management will have benefits for all. Critif then produced a, we provided the technical assistance, and as a catalyst, we had a two-dimensional river model for the, low, for the whole of the Lower Imkamati, which was over 1,300 kilometers in size. And by doing that, we, uh, we managed as a catalyst to get the organizations to work together to look at the flood risk. We brought the stakeholders along the journey over a four-year period, and we managed to prove economically, financially, and with an engineering perspective that if you protect each other from the low return period flood events, do not consider looking at the high return flood events, then there's economic, economic benefits for all parties. And we pushed then for the private sector to invest in flood risk management options for the lower communities that will actually improve the livelihoods and reduce flooding vulnerability for the poorest communities in the region. And just finally, we're continuing this project with grant assistance. We've got some outcomes of the partnership, but I'm running out of time. And finally, why has it worked so far? The reason it's worked so far, we've been the honest broker. We've provided the data, the models, the catalyst to get the organizations to work together. And we've been a constant there for the last four years to build our stakeholders and influence our clients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, uh, coming from uh, GWP, I can myself say we've got wonderful experience with the catalytic uh, reactions that work with you can generate, having done the multi-stakeholder work for you in the Livingston um, uh, Climate Resilient Water Supply Project. Um, but now we're going to travel from the southern side of the African continent up to the northern side. Um, Sarah, do you want to do it from here or there? Um, can we have a... Uh, yep, uh, there is a... Flip here. There we go. You want to? Yeah. So we are going to do a very elegant change of guards here. Moving over to Sarah Tuzi, who will tell us how this is working, or rather not working, and what are the challenges that we should really discuss here in the transboundary work in between Algeria, Libya, and Tunisia. Over to you, Sarah. So thank you very much, Monica. Indeed, uh, we will move to North Africa and to have some lessons from the uh, transboundary cooperation in that part of the world. But just a few things uh, that I wanted to introduce with my presentation is about why uh, transboundary cooperation matters.
also to examine with the countries what can be the impacts of climate change at transboundary level, though it's, uh, as I said, it's non-renewable, so uh, very quickly you can say, but impact will not really, uh, 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 sorry, climate change will not really impact uh, water resources there, but actually they, it will, and this is, was our work where we uh, uh, quantified not only the direct impacts on water resources, but also the indirect impacts which, that were more important related to the, the increase of water demand in the basin. And of course, we had some very interesting results about the risks that will be uh, coming out of this um, climate change uh, impact, including, uh, as I said, uh, in increasing the risk of the lowering of the water table uh, until an, an that can reach a level of an inversion of the saline gradient that is irreversible. So you really lose your whole aquifer. So the risk is really serious. Um, and more importantly, we, we, had, we had an estimation of uh, the cost of no action. So if no adaptation action will be uh, undertaken, we can have a loss of fields in the basin that can reach 5% by 2030 to 30, 20 to 30% by 2020, 2050. So this is an important uh, risk. Um, so then we discussed with the country what we need to do, what actions we need to take. And here we started working with them through a nexus, di nexus dialogue. Because re remember I told you about the connection between energy, land, and water in this basin. And we tried to understand uh, what's happening, what are the interlinkages, and what can be the solutions. Um, and also hoping that after this uh, identification of joint solution, we can go and look for funds. But the thing is that, and wanted, uh, as, as, uh, what I wanted to stress in this uh, particular panel is that we did this mapping exercise for this solution, but very quickly we were um, and, uh, challenged, challenged by the fact that the institutional setting, the governance mechanism in place, doesn't really allow to go for uh, um, requests for funds and infrastructure funds. And this is something that we needed to work on, and that's why now we are continuing the collaboration with the countries and the consultation uh, mechanism with OSS and UN. Uh, trying to bring three dimensions, the next assessment, the next sorry, assessment, so to have the solution, but also working on building a vision for the basin, uh, so uh, we know where we are going uh, um, at, at long term, plus in parallel have the enhancement of the institutional and legal setting of the consultation mechanism that will allow to leverage funds in this particular basin. So, uh, very quickly, conclusion from the experience here, what are, is that uh, we need really to build trust, first of all, it's key, but then we need to have a transboundary uh, mechanism that can evolve on time. Uh, and um, we have, uh, we need to have enabling environment as a prerequisite, really, to um, draw investments. And, and if I may continue, because uh, this program now also we are trying to connect it to the uh, Pan-African uh, um, uh, effort and uh, very recently I'm really happy to uh, inf inform you from uh, uh, actually uh, last week um, uh, happened uh, this uh, this uh, signing of an MIU between GWP and uh, uh, the and NEPAD who are um, in charge of implementing the program for infrastructure development in Africa the PETA program uh, and uh, just this came out, this uh, MAO was a result of uh, a conclusion uh, of uh, uh, a study that was done by AMCO and NEPAD and showing that uh, um, I don't know how much you are familiar about uh, the PIDA program, but it has four pillars, water, uh, energy, transport, and ICT, and the projects related to water, they... Uh, um, they um, they showed little progress uh, in the framework of the, uh, in the f or sorry, progress for the implementation of the previous work plan of, uh, of, uh, of PIDA. So our work with uh, PIDA or MIU will uh, help indeed to accelerate uh, transboundary uh, water, uh, PIDA water projects implementation through uh, project preparation, through transaction management, through resources mobilization, advocacy, also capacity building, because this is also an important uh, uh, thing that was mentioned also by Oshward. Sometimes you don't have the capacity in the basins to work collaboratively uh, for fundraising and uh, through uh, the NEPSIS approach. And I will, I have one minute and <laughs> to left, so I will just 
finish also because we are also in the COP and uh, we know that uh, NDCs and NAP I, are, are the guiding documents of the, do, uh, of the, of the countries for uh, climate actions implementation. And I just wanted also to announce you that, um, as you know, the uh, UNFCCC, uh, they did, um, they produced the technical guidelines uh, for uh, NAP's uh, preparation and uh, uh, GWP also uh, uh, pre developed a water dedicated uh, supplement uh, technical guide and that this uh, technical guide actually will be uh, updated, revised and uh, the next uh, version of this technical uh, uh, guideline will, uh, will be released in 2019 and maybe just very quickly why this is important and we think that this is important because um, indeed Okay, I'm short of time. So what I will say is wait for the release of the NAP, NAP technical guidelines and you will have a lot of information to see why transboundary cooperation is important to be considered while preparing NAPs. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much, Sarah, for, <laughs> for being, oops. Thank you for very much for staying within the time because we've, it's fa fascinating, I find, seeing the perspectives, the different perspectives that we're all bringing to that really difficult, difficult conundrum of how to manage water resources across boundaries, uh, the way uh, Oswald had laid out the challenges earlier. And so it's good to see the financial, the catalytic perspective earlier, and then from where Sarah comes at the work on building trust, but also making sure that technical guidelines and input is available where people are struggling with things on the ground. Now, but let's hear it from uh, somebody who actually does it on everyday basis. Um, Abdel Guerra is the technical director at the Niger Basin Authority. Abdel, do you want to come up and shed some light on how are you facing the daily challenges of operating in a transboundary context uh, when trying to manage the water and the related challenges. Over to you, Abdel. And I will signal to you your timing. Are you there? Okay, c'est bon. Okay. Uh, merci, uh, Madame la modératrice. Uh, merci aux organisateurs et organisatrices de, cette, de ce panel pour uh, l'invitation faite à l'ABN. Et également pour l'opportunité qui nous est offerte de partager uh, l'expérience de l'autorité du bassin du Niger en matière d'accompagnement des États membres pour l'adaptation au changement climatique. Et je commencerai ma présentation en posant cette question. Pourquoi soutenir les actions transfrontalières pour la résilience au changement Évidemment, il y a plusieurs réponses à cela, mais quelques trois qui me paraissent assez pertinents. Je disais parce que certains phénomènes ont un caractère local et se produisent localement, mais ont des impacts transfrontaliers qui, généralement, requièrent une coordination et une synergie d'action pour leur prise en charge. C'est le cas de l'ensablement, des plans d'eau et des cours d'eau, pour lesquels le front de réseau se fait très loin, souvent, et le sédiment est transporté très loin en aval et pour, évidemment, au-delà des frontières. C'est également le cas des phénomènes idéologiques extrêmes, qui ont souvent leur origine également très loin en amont et qui nécessitent une coordination, un échange d'informations pour les gestions. C'est également, et nous disons, que certaines actions nationales d'adaptation ont des impacts transfrontaliers négatifs. Et c'est le cas d'une sorte de maladaptation. Souvent, si on prend garde, les barrages structurants et imposent une coopération et une coordination pour leur réalisation et aussi faciliter l'accès aux pays membres à des financements régionaux qui souvent sont inaccessibles dans le contexte, évidemment, et de la coopération bilatérale. Alors, que fait l'ABN pour accompagner ces États membres dans cet exercice pour le renforcement surtout de la résilience au changement climatique dans le bassin Je ne m'attarderai pas sur le bassin du Niger, mais juste un mot en disant que c'est un fleuve c'est un bassin actif, c'est neuf pays qui se le partagent, environ 160 millions de personnes qui y vivent 
Et ceci a nécessité à des très tôt, évidemment, et les pays en partage ont perçu la nécessité de se mettre ensemble pour prendre, gérer, gérer le patrimoine commun, notamment les ressources du bassin, en créant la commission du fleuve Niger dès 1964. Avec les nouveaux défis apparaissant, cette commission a été transformée en une autorité à partir de 1980, en lui donnant le but de promouvoir la coopération entre les États membres, d'une part, et d'assurer le développement intégré et, et du bassin du Niger dans un certain nombre de domaines. Alors, les différentes études faites au niveau du bassin du point de vue climatique nous révèlent que le bassin est une région extrêmement vulnérable au changement climatique et plusieurs facteurs exacerbent cette vulnérabilité, dont notamment la vulnérabilité des économies des États, dont neuf, le 6 des 9 sont classés parmi les plus pauvres. C'est également la fréquence des sécheresses et la récurrence des inondations devenant de plus en plus forte et de plus en plus fréquente, évidemment, et de plus en plus violente. Il y a la forte croissance démographique avec forte pression sur les ressources naturelles et l'environnement, la fragilité, évidemment, de nos institutions en charge des questions climatiques. Les problèmes sécuritaires apparus ces dernières années avec comme corollaire le développement des populations déjà vulnérables et qui donc exacerbent cette vulnérabilité. Alors, également, le bassin était caractérisé, ou il est caractérisé, je dirais, par une variabilité climatique historiquement eh, importante. Ça, c'est au-dessus, c'est l'évolution de la pluviométrie depuis 1960. Et la figure d'en bas, et à gauche, c'est évidemment et le régime du fleuve, comment depuis 1960 ça a évolué. Vous voyez bien en fonction de la saisonnalité. Une autre caractéristique, c'est l'incertitude qui caractérise les différentes projections climatiques au niveau du bassin. Vous avez 16 modèles climatiques globaux qui divergent dans leurs prévisions. Mais nonobstant cela, il y a quand même trois grandes tendances qu'il faut retenir en matière de changement climatique dans le bassin du Niger. C'est que la température va continuer à monter pour atteindre 3 degrés à l'horizon 2065. C'est que les précipitations vont, leur variabilité va croître, évidemment, avec des phénomènes de plus en plus, des phénomènes d'inondation, de sécheresse de plus en plus fréquentes et de plus en plus intenses. C'est que également au niveau du delta maritime, le niveau de la mer, il y aura une hausse, évidemment, du niveau de la mer. Alors, devant ces grands défis, les États membres, depuis 2002, s'étaient engagés, ont engagé l'autorité dans une vision partagée et qui devait permettre, et, et, qui est une vision d'ensemble du développement du bassin qui serait négocié d'abord par les États et accepté par tous. Et, et cet exercice nous a amené à adopter le plan d'action de développement durable du bassin du Niger avec un programme d'investissement chiffré à 9,335,000 milliards de dollars pour les 20 ans 2008-2027. Et la première, en trois composantes, dont la première constitue réellement un programme de, de mobilisation de l'eau et pour produire, pour régénérer l'hydroélectricité, pour évidemment également la préservation des, des, des écosystèmes du bassin et le renforcement des capacités. Après cinq ans de mise, à, de mise en œuvre du premier plan quinquennal, nous avons fait une évaluation de l'exercice et nous avons également pris en compte un certain nombre de défis nouveaux pour évidemment aller dans une planification stratégique qui nous permettait de mieux préciser le contenu des deux plans quinquennaux qui allaient suivre sur les dix ans. Et ceci nous a amené à, donc à, à ce plan stratégique structuré autour de cinq axes. Donc les deux premiers sont quasiment les deux premiers axes du, et du, du PADD, du plan d'action de développement durable qu'on avait déjà adopté. Mais le troisième axe de renforcement des capacités et d'implication des acteurs de la GIR, on a trouvé nécessaire évidemment de les décliner en trois, en trois eh, axes stratégiques, notamment le financement qui est une question cruciale, la coopération avec les États, avec nos partenaires qui également est un axe évidemment qu'il fallait renforcer et les performances organisationnelles qui constituent la, eh, le, le, la clé de succès de la mise en œuvre du, 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 du plan. Et ce plan est stratégique, donc décliné en un plan opérationnel, 
En un plan opérationnel, évidemment, et structuré en cinq programmes, 13 sous-programmes, 37 projets, 350 actions pour un coût de 7 milliards, 200. Et ce plan contient un plan PIC. Dans le film tout à l'heure, on disait qu'on avait un plan d'investissement climat de 446 actions. Ces 46, 446 actions sont sélectionnées parmi les 350 actions du plan opérationnel et qui sont des actions orientées vers l'adaptation au changement climatique parce que c'était l'objectif du PIC. Et ce PIC, évidemment, a été chiffré à 3 milliards, évidemment, et 110 millions de dollars. À date, parce que nous, et ce, et ce PIC, il faut le rappeler, a été présenté à la COP21 à Paris. Aujourd'hui, on est où par rapport à sa mise en œuvre Concrètement, évidemment, nous avons d'abord des projets qui sont en cours. Il y en a plusieurs, pour à peu près 50 millions de dollars. Et donc ces projets, évidemment, qui sont en cours, certains finiront en 2019. Quelques exemples, évidemment, de résultats, notamment du programme de lutte contre le et sa consolidation. Ça, c'est la restauration des terres dégradées ou des plateaux latéritiques incultes. Ça, c'est un site restauré qui, évidemment, après trois, deux saisons, évidemment, commence à produire la biomasse. Ici, nous sommes sur une dune, évidemment, qui borde le fleuve et qui menace l'ensablement et qui a été stabilisée par la fixation des dunes. Nous avons ici les protections des berges et des, des affluents. Et là, un périmètre de production de bourbou pour l'alimentation du bétail d'abord et pour la protection du fleuve. Maintenant, les projets en instance de démarrage qui démarreront, le film l'a annoncé, en 2019. C'est le PIDAC, le programme intégré de développement et d'adaptation au changement climatique qui est négocié avec la Banque africaine de l'Ouvrance, un certain nombre de partenaires, et qui, effectivement, eh, permettrait de réaliser les réalisations physiques que nous attendons. C'est la poursuite de cette restauration de l'environnement dégradé, de la préservation, évidemment, des écosystèmes et de eh, le renforcement des capacités des acteurs. Et l'autre, au niveau de la composante 2, c'est tout ce qui est mobilisation des ressources en eau pour, évidemment, produire et continuer à produire et là, nous avons donc, le PIDAC fait 232 millions de dollars, donc 80% de dons, et donc nous disons qu'il sera lancé en 2019. Un autre projet, c'est le projet d'amélioration de l'agir et la gouvernance, et qui est financé donc par le FEM, et qui fait un coût de 13,7 millions de dollars, et qui, dont les conventions sont signées, et nous le lancerons avant fin janvier 2019, Inch'Allah. Le deuxième, le troisième programme, c'est le programme de développement de la résilience au changement climatique, qui est financé par la Banque mondiale et qui donc évidemment fait 795 millions, en fait 500 millions de dollars, dont la première phase de 66 millions de dollars démarre l'année prochaine. Donc à date, le PIC est financé à peu près à 25,56%. Il reste un gap dont le financement reste toujours recherché. Maintenant, les conclusions ou les leçons que nous tirons, il y en a trois, c'est que l'organe de bassin constitue un centre pertinent d'action pour accompagner les pays membres dans le renforcement de la résilience. Nous disons également que l'OBT doit bénéficier du soutien politique d'abord de ses États membres et un soutien financier nécessaire pour mieux planifier et mettre en œuvre les actions d'adaptation. Et nous disons que la coopération autour des cours d'eau transfrontaliers doit évoluer vers une coopération autour des projets structurants communs qui devraient générer évidemment des, des, des bénéfices pour mieux s'adapter au changement climatique. Je vous remercie pour votre aimable attention. Thank you. Oops. Thank you very much, uh, Abdel. Um, this was a beautiful introduction, I should say, about the important role that um, organizations like the Nigeria Basin Authority play. Um, this is really also something where we can see so clearly that water is not a sector, but it is a connector. Um, we will now hear um, three quick responses from organizations that work very strongly in helping address the challenges that are out there um, and that are being addressed in the um, transboundary context. With that, um, Sonia, can you tell us briefly about UNECE and how you are helping address the transboundary challenges, not just on the water end, because that's what you've been doing for a couple of years, but also as climate change exacerbates and accelerates the ch challenges that these authorities have to address. Thank you very much. My name is Sonia Koppel from the Water Convention, and I believe Sarah has already said, and all of you actually know why 
uh, cooperation on climate change adaptation is important. Uh, and the examples we have heard have very well shown the necessity but also the benefits uh, because it, the most important, I believe, is that it actually makes adaptation more effective and efficient to work at the basin level. But most of the discussions here and generally are still very much focused on national level climate and mitigation and adaptation. And um, um, whereas uh, river basin organization at the basin level is so important. Um, and that's why we need uh, a legal and institutional framework at the global level to foster uh, transboundary cooperation. Um, and it was mentioned at the outset already by the African Development Bank that the Water Convention uh, provides such a unique legal and institutional framework. It's um, at this stage the only intergovernmental framework at the global level uh, which helps countries to cooperate. Um, and you can see here it's not only a legal framework but also has an active institutional framework with activities on the ground, um, uh, for example, on climate change adaptation. Uh, and including actually also projects uh, in specific basins. Um, and I don't have the, detail to, the time to go into detail about the convention, but if you have questions, you may ask me. So um, already back in 2006, uh, the countries recognized that we need, that uh, it's necessary to, to work at a basin level. So there are different activities started, uh, developing of guidance documents, uh, exchange of experience platform, and a creation of a network and several publications. Here you can see the basins which are part of the network. And in this framework, we have, have promoted the development of adaptation strategies at the basin level. For example, on the Neyman Basin and Nyesan in Eastern Europe, uh, on the, um, but also in, in Africa. And um, this has then, after several years of work, shown exactly what was said at the beginning here, at the outset of the event, that basins struggle uh, they don't have the capacity to develop actually bankable projects for uh, climate change adaptation. Um, and um, uh, that's why we, s we started a partnership um, with the, the World Bank, the African Development Bank, the EIB, uh, uh, but also INBO, uh, and uh, Netherlands and Switzerland and other organizations, um, also TWP, and we organized a training on how to prepare such uh, bankable projects for climate change adaptation in Transbondi Basin last year in Senegal. And we are planning future similar trainings in the future. And the World Bank, uh, the publication which will be presented by Greg just afterwards, uh, is one of the outcomes of this. And here you can see some of the um, good practice examples which, has, which have been happening, like Lake Victoria Basin Commission also had a uh, Transbondi adaptation proposal accepted by the Adaptation Fund. And um, all this, I think, shows that um, um, cooperation on climate change adaptation can even uh, facilitate uh, transbody cooperation more broadly. Um, and also that for development banks, uh, um, international water law and uh, enabling legal and institutional frameworks is actually crucial for investment also. So with this, I would like to close and invite you also to our upcoming activities. Uh, uh, such as a uh, next global workshop on, on this topic and network meeting which we organize uh, next year in, in Geneva. Thank you. Anyone would be nice. Thank you. <laughs> That's nice. And uh, I just a, a word of compliment also to UNECE, um, having spent some time with them and their um, convention earlier this year. I was quite impressed to see how many countries are starting to take an active interest in joining um, with delegations from Asia and uh, various parts of the African continent, that American continent, considering this uh, right now. Um, but with that, uh, very fascinating, so the River Basin Organization are organized themselves. Indeed. So what are you doing in four minutes in okay. uh, helping them face the uh, triple whammy challenge that they have, water management in a transboundary context and exacerbated by climate change? Thank you. So indeed, uh, I come from INBO, the International Network of Basin Organizations. My name is Edouard Boinet. 
and when we address the issue of adaptation to climate change in transboundary basins, we agree on one very important point here. I believe that we all do. Infrastructures are essential. We need them, we need concrete projects that are needed for uh, both adaptation to climate change and sustainable development. Uh, and when I mean concrete, when I say concrete, what I mean is field projects, projects that are made of country, concrete, or that are uh, involving green infrastructures, well, something that you can touch, that you can see, and that your constituents will understand uh, as a contribution, uh, making progress in water resources management. But, and that's a big but here, we are failing to deliver these infrastructures. And why are we failing? Well, you can hardly build an infrastructure without a non-infrastructural environment, without the governance, without the data, without the planning, without the financing. Um, and if you do build your infrastructure without this non-infrastructural environment, well, you may do more arms than good. And uh, that's why we believe that we need to develop non-infrastructural projects. A, a very clear example on data, for instance, with, for instance, which is one of the big, big blind spots that we have. Um, if you try to choose a location for a dam without the data, if you try to design a dam without the data, you can be sure that you will put it in the worst place possible and you will not get the performance that you expect from it. We have a lot of examples of short lifespan and very expensive hydropower dams with terrible negative externalities for ecosystem else and human else, and as well, poor performance in the production of power, which was the first goal that we set for them. Um, you get, for instance, dams that just do not fill with water, but with sediments, and that's, of course, a very important problem. So you need data to build trust and initiate the cooperation. You need data to design the infrastructures, and of course, you need the money. Right, banks? <laughs> and here? The issue is not the volume of money. The issue, and you will have understand that, uh, understood that already with what I've just said, is more the access uh, than the volume. Uh, we need more of the available, available money for non-infrastructural projects, and we need also to take into account the fact that we have a very complex landscape of climate finance. Uh, it's, in addition, a landscape that has been structured for single state approach. So it's very difficult when you're coming as a non-state actor or as a basin organization to access those funds. And we have to mention that transboundary basin organizations are just sometimes not equipped to prepare projects and access, um, say, adaptation fund or green climate fund. So we need to accompany this basin's uh, organizations, transboundary basin organization, in the preparation phase. Um, that's what we call the incubation. We've launched, launched this in COP22. Uh, when I mean we, it's the Global Alliances for Water and Climate, UNEC, INBO, uh, UNESCO, and many other organizations are involved in this. The idea is to provide technical assistance for project preparation uh, before the feasibility phase, because we've learned from our partners from development banks that indeed it's not the uh, money the issue, but the identification of good quality projects that just do not reach the feasibility of development banks. So we are here for that. We provide that support. We have many projects that we have accompanied over time in the first phase of uh, this uh, adventure initiative. Uh, and now the issue that we have is both getting the funding for the incubation phase and getting the incubated projects implemented. Here in the first phase, we have uh, provided support to the Congo River Basin in order to develop a water information system and to the Senegal River Basin in order to help them monitor the impacts of climate change precisely on the dam that uh, prevents the intrusion of salt in the basin. So we have now 100 projects that we are preparing for adaptation in Africa. Uh, you are both uh, invited to 
contact us and provide the idea of project that you have when you are a transboundary basin organization and we are when you are a development bank well uh, to support uh, this initiative and the projects that we are defending uh, i give you now uh, a date please come to the one planet summit on the 14th of march next year as we will organize in nairobi an important meeting for the support of this initiative thank you very much thank you very much and with that i would if i get a mic i have a mic um, i would like to turn it over to greg browder the global lead for water security and water resource management at the world bank and uh, as we have also seen here not only is water resource management and transboundary context not for the faint-hearted it's also not for anybody alone right so um, over to you to discuss a little bit some of the things that you are have done in a very large partnership now okay thank you everyone um, very interesting session today and I heard a number of key points one is the need to cooperate on transboundary water management the urgency of this issue, particularly in the face of climate change. And then the other part of this is the need to find, develop bankable projects to have real impact on the ground and then to finance them. So in response to these needs, a group of development partners, including the World Bank, uh, UNEC, INBO, and uh, anyone else I'm missing? African Development Bank, of course. Uh, we banded together to produce a report called Financing Climate Change Adaptation in Transboundary Basins, Preparing Bankable Projects. This report will be available in about uh, two weeks in English, uh, shortly afterwards in French. I'm sorry, we tried very hard to get it done for this uh, event, but uh, we'll pass out flyers here and you can uh, get more information on the report and also there's a link where you can uh, download the report. So um, yes, I uh, actually have more slides, but since we're short on time, I will stop here and I think we'll have a little bit of time for questions. So please uh, do uh, look at the report when you have time and thank you very much to our partners in preparation for, of this report. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this has been a, a real team product. Uh, a lot of people have contributed and I think we're all quite keen to find out more about it. Um, uh, did we have any questions from the um, live transmission? If so, I don't see that at the moment. Um, are there any questions, suggestions, thoughts to any of the panel members that we have or to um, Jonathan, whom we have here with us? Jonathan, you want to move a little bit up here? Um, there's a mic that can go around that we would be having on a roving manner. Please, over to you. Um, bonjour tout le monde. Merci. And uh, if you can introduce yourself. Okay. <laughs> bonjour. Uh, je m'appelle Awad Mabrouk. Je suis sociologue, experte en questions du genre uh, eau et climat et justice, surtout climatique. Uh, C'est le mot qui convient le, le plus. Donc, uh, moi, je voudrais y réagir par rapport à à tout ce qui se passe dans les bassins transfrontaliers, mais aussi dans, dans le monde entier, dans nos politiques publiques. Euh, je, je fais ce plaidoyer de plus en plus par rapport à la question du genre, de l'intégration du genre. Nos pays, euh, aussi bien dans, dans, dans le, le continent africain, mais ailleurs, euh, ne prennent pas en considération suffisamment la politique publique genre. C'est-à-dire que le genre, c'est une petite composante que tous les bailleurs eh, formidable qu'il soit, dans en toute petite composante en lien avec des projets programmes tout petits. Eh, on a tout un folklore autour du genre après sa part. Nos politiques ont besoin eh, euh, d'institutionnaliser le genre, de démocratiser et d'intégrer d'une manière impérative et urgente le genre. Donc face à cela, un témoignage, puisque euh, j'ai vécu aussi une expérience transfrontalière, euh, lors de l'étude qui a été commanditée par le JWPMED et qui a concerné le SAS. Donc euh, j'ai moi-même établi cette, cette étude et je ne vous cache pas ma douleur. Hein. Le bonheur que j'ai eu, la douleur, de me rendre compte que non seulement il y a de la dis, du désistement pays, mais que ce désistement peut s'amplifier.
quantifier davantage quand il s'agit de régions. Donc on a fait l'étude, les lacunes sont là, elles n'ont pas beaucoup bougé. L'étude, bien évidemment, pour rappeler les pays du SAS, c'est Libye, Tunisie et Algérie. Nous avons essayé par tous les moyens de, de, de sortir avec la stratégie, bien sûr, c'était un peu la mission stratégie euh, genre. Euh, et euh, voilà, pour ne pas accaparer beaucoup la parole, c'est pour dire la difficulté institutionnelle à tous les niveaux, à tous les échelons, qui est sortie fortement par rapport à la question, par rapport au renforcement de capacité dont monsieur a évoqué maintenant et qui ne bouge que très peu. Donc, prière, c'est un appel euh, de dire qu'aujourd'hui, le transfrontalier, notamment à, par rapport à la question de l'eau et du genre, parce que qui dit genre dit santé. Nous, moi je suis tunisienne et j'ai beaucoup travaillé sur la question eau et genre en Tunisie. Nous avons maintenant des indicateurs assez douloureuses par rapport à la salubrité de l'eau par rapport au, à l'organisation paysanne qui manque la présence des femmes, alors que les femmes, c'est la santé de la famille. Les femmes, c'est le, bon le, bon, le bon messager pour sensibiliser, pour gérer mieux. Ne parlons pas de l'agir qui n'intègre pas encore nos politiques. Donc, euh, c'est juste une petite attention pour qu'il y ait plus de, de prise en compte euh, sérieuse, impérative, parce qu'aujourd'hui, je pense que le climat ne changera pas sans que le genre ne soit pris en compte d'une manière urgente, impérative et sans manipulation qui peut se faire et sans perdre encore plus de temps. Merci. Thank you very much. And if you could pass on the, the mic over to the next gentleman and then here, and then we're going to go and have some responses from the panel. Please, if you would go ahead. Merci. And if you could introduce yourself. Je suis Nikes Bolombi, je viens du Gabon. Je viens de la société civile. Je suis le vice-président du Conseil économique et social environnemental du Gabon. Je prends la parole parce que je suis avec beaucoup d'intérêt le panel. C'est très bien. Tout ce qui a été présenté fait un lien entre santé et environnement. Comment vous influencez les politiques publiques sans données scientifiques sur la qualité des eaux des bassins Je n'ai pas vu une donnée précise aujourd'hui pour les projets qui sont déjà lancés. J'aurais bien voulu avoir la qualité physico-chimique des eaux aujourd'hui, qui est une préoccupation essentielle. Où nous venons de sortir un modèle. Pendant 18 mois, nous avons bénéficié d'un appui de la Banque africaine de développement, un million d'euros. Nous avons réalisé l'étude et nous avons remis l'étude au gouvernement gabonais en tant qu'ONG. Je viens de faire une communication à la conférence de l'OMS Santé et Environnement et on se rend compte que le lien est fort. Comment on fait pour influencer les politiques au niveau des CER, puisque vous parlez des bassins transfrontaliers Je veux bien que la Banque mondiale ait lancé cette dynamique au niveau de l'eau, c'est très bien. Comment on fait Je voudrais qu'on arrive à ce type de modèle, parce que nous avons déjà une modélisation qui est là, et on va peut-être la faire partager très prochainement à l'Assemblée générale de la Banque africaine de développement qui aura lieu en Guinée équatoriale. Et pourquoi est-ce que ça a été un oubli par rapport euh, à ceux qui ont présenté, notamment le bassin du, euh, du Tchad, euh, le, bassin, euh, le bassin du Niger, voilà, que je suis bien évidemment de, depuis longtemps. Merci. Thank you very much. And then the gentleman up here front, please. Merci, Madame la modératrice. Moi, je m'appelle Nouradine Zakaria Touré. Je suis le président de la société civile du bassin du Niger. Je voudrais rappeler que les bailleurs de fonds comme la Banque mondiale, la BAD, doivent se lever très tôt. Vous savez, la question de l'immigration, c'est quand les jeunes ont commencé à mourir dans l'océan Atlantique et dans la Méditerranée, qu'on a crié. Mais le désert a tué plus que la mer. Parce que pour arriver à la mer, il faut traverser le désert. Et le désert, c'est l'effet des changements climatiques. Pourquoi quelqu'un quitte chez lui, dans son terroir où il est né, pour aller en Europe qu'il n'a jamais vue Parce que les gens vivent dans l'extrême pauvreté. Les conditions de vie sont macabres. Et c'est ça que le DT a dit. Sur les neuf pays du bassin du Niger, vous avez au moins six qui vivent dans des extrêmes pauvretés. Une année de chesseresse extrême, une année d'inondation. Moi, je suis chef de village, j'ai fait trois mois dans mon village. Toutes les digues que nous avons réalisées, l'eau est venue, il a tout détruit. 
Les jeunes ne peuvent pas rester dans ça. Et ça, c'est de la responsabilité de la communauté internationale. Si la France ou l'Europe, de façon générale, ne veut pas recevoir les gens, il faut les aider à s'installer chez eux. Encore mieux que, historiquement, ces pays nous ont pillés aussi, au-delà de, des changements climatiques. Donc, je crois qu'il est important qu'on réfléchisse plus en profondeur. Hier, dans un panel, quelqu'un a dit « Trump sort du changement climatique » et il veut financer 380 milliards de dollars pour l'effet de brousse en Californie. C'est ça aussi le problème. Quand on vous expose le problème, il faut que les partenaires s'investissent. Il faut mobiliser les ressources financières. Moi, je suis obligé de rester au village parce que je suis un chef de village, mais les 2 000, 3 000, 10 000 jeunes ne sont pas obligés. Ils quittent le village pour aller au Niger. Si ça ne marche pas, ils vont aller au Ghana. Si ça ne marche pas, il revient et prend le désert, du dés le désert à 800 km sans un po seul point d'eau. Et c'est ça qui a fait que ce que vous appelez en Europe djihadistes, terroristes, ont occupé le terrain. Parce que les deux tiers du Mali sont des zones désertiques. Personne n'y vit. Il n'y a pas de l'eau. Il n'y a rien à manger. Et les gens sont en train de courir pour aller dans les centres urbains. Maintenant, les centres urbains, on ne trouve plus le gardiennage ou nettoyer. Parce que comme les fonctionnaires eux-mêmes n'ont plus l'eau, et même nettoyer leur chambre, il faut le gardiennage la nuit. Donc, fondamentalement, le problème que nous avons, c'est exactement ça. Il s'agit de, de, de mobiliser les ressources financières pour faire des projets qui permettent de lutter contre la pauvreté, d'améliorer les conditions de vie des populations, et les gens vont rester chez eux, ils n'ont rien à faire avec le Canada, ou la France, ou l'Union Européenne, ou la Pologne, etc., etc., et c'est fondamental. Il faut que la Banque mondiale, la BAD, les autres partenaires s'engagent. Il faut mettre plus de ressources. Parce que si vous ne mettez pas plus de ressources, le désert avance. Si vous ne vous tardez à mettre les ressources, le climat change. Si vous ne mettez pas de ressources, l'immigration continue à avancer. Donc il faut mettre les ressources nécessaires. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Merci. Une dernière remarque, so that we can invite some okay. of the panel reactions, please. Euh, merci bien. Je pense qu'il a touché un peu du doigt euh, euh, l'aspect sur lequel je voudrais insister. C'est pourquoi au niveau, par exemple, des organismes de bassin, euh, le directeur technique euh, l'a dit, nous avons énormément, nous avons besoin d'argent pour investir. Et je, je pense que M. Grec, euh, M. Grec a certainement été stratégique parce qu'il attend certainement une question pour développer un peu plus son, 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 son truc là. Alors, je vous pose la question, on fait comment pour pouvoir avoir accès à ces ressources-là afin d'investir Parce que si on n'investit pas, il l'a dit, c'est un villageois. Moi, je ne suis pas villageois, a priori, je travaille dans l'administration, mais on se rejoint sur ce plan-là. Comment on fait pour investir Parce que tout ce qu'on dit, là, à Borne, il y avait une communauté, de, 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 enfin, la population civile qui, qui, qui s'appelait Blablabla. Bla. Il voulait simplement nous dire qu'on parle beaucoup, mais on ne fait rien. Je crois que tout à l'heure, là, en venant aussi, il y a un petit groupe aussi à côté qui dit la même chose. Donc, il faut qu'on investisse. Tout ce qu'on fait, si on n'aboutit pas à une amélioration des conditions de vie des populations, tout ce qu'on fait ne sert à rien. C'est à la fois la communauté internationale, c'est à la fois le travail des scientifiques, les bailleurs de fonds, etc. On est tous concernés. Je vous remercie. Thank you very much. And I think what we're now going to do, um, uh, first of all, let me also acknowledge the uh, three important points that were made. Firstly, the question about gender and how much or not enough the work that is being done in the transboundary water resource management perspective has institutional solutions on the gender end. And I can see everybody here mm. wanting to speak, <laughs> but I will not allow this because we will have one person with one answer, and we we're just going to go through this here right now. So the first question is, where do we see serious good examples for bringing gender into uh, the management of water resources in transboundary context? The second question was, who's got data on water quality, particularly with regard to chemicals and others, so that one can actually take specific action on this one? And the last one was in that very, very serious and correct observations that the burden, the pain 
of climate change comes to the poor people first, longest and deepest? And how does one best access funding and support, whether it's on the government level or uh, from the international community to help address some of that so that the inequality that is inherent in the countries we work in, that that doesn't get exacerbated even further by the climate change um, impacts that are coming. So we're going to go, everybody gets a chance to speak, but if I could ask you to only respond to one of those three things and really try to stay within one or two minutes. These are all very deep and very important topics. But we're all going to stay around here, but let's try to take it from the perspective of closing. And maybe if I can start here with Jonathan so that we'll get the Africa Development Bank at the end to have the last word. So Jonathan, one thing that of the three things that you want to address very briefly, gender, water quality information, or the inequality of climate change and how one can uh, identify resources to address that specifically. Okay, I'm going to talk about the gender component, which I think is, is extremely relevant. And, and basically, you know, our organization, Critifa, only just starting to touch the surface of this from a transboundary basin perspective. And what we're actually trying to do is the next steps of the Imkamati project is to further engage with the private sector to bring more of a sort of gender sensitive approach. And if we can do that with the private sector as a starting point and expand that with the communities and the outgrowers working with the private sector and the government organizations, maybe that's a small step forward. Thank you very much. And thank you for staying within the time. One enlightening perspective from you, Greg, which are the three topics? Um, yes, I will uh, respond to the question about the impact of uh, climate change on, uh, on local communities, particularly those in poor areas. Um, you know, the World Bank has done a lot of work on the impact of climate change, and there's no doubt that there are huge economic losses uh, that, can, uh, that will be generated through climate change, even under good scenarios. And we estimate on the order of 6% in some countries, the, um, the gross domestic product will be reduced due to climate impacts. We can see already this is causing problems and instability of countries, not only in uh, Africa, but other regions of the world, the Middle East, parts of Asia, and also spurring uh, migration throughout the globe, um, Africa included. So we recognize the importance of these problems. Uh, the World Bank is committed to trying to help address these issues. We rolled out a new climate uh, adaptation resiliency strategy. We're trying to back it up with uh, significantly increased funding to address these issues. Um, one of the problems that we face though, it's not so much financing, it's finding investments that are sustainable so, um, you know, I encourage you to work with your governments, with your organizations, your local communities to develop good uh, investments that uh, we can invest in for climate resiliency. And I'm sure some of the other uh, speakers who are more familiar with the African context will discuss, you know, how do we actually channel these funds? Because they're there, but we're having a challenge, uh, you know, spending the money actually. And spending it so that it addresses the inequalities and impact. Sarah. Merci beaucoup. Je veux réagir en français comme les deux questions. Ce que je, ce que je voulais adresser sont, sont, sont intervenues en français. Par rapport à la question, juste peut-être ma réaction par rapport à ça, c'est que combien il nous reste encore de travail pour justement s'attaquer à toutes ces questions pertinentes que vous avez touchées. Par rapport euh, euh, au genre, justement, euh, ce que nous essayons de faire, de faire justement et à travers le témoignage que l'experte a donné, c'est d'essayer déjà d'intégrer dans les mécanismes institutionnels des, de la gouvernance transfrontalière des groupes de travail qui s'intéressent à la question genre. C'est ce que nous essayons de faire dans le, au niveau du SAS. J'espère qu'on va réussir des focus groups sur la question du genre, mais aussi genre justement dans le développement local avec des actions concrètes sur le terrain. Et ça me permet de faire le lien avec justement la question de la migration. Je pense qu'on devrait aussi voir dans toutes les actions d'adaptation de, plutôt des opportunités d'emploi. Donc comment justement renforcer la durabilité des actions 
qu'on nous mettons sur le, le, le terrain pour encourager des jeunes à s'installer, des jeunes à créer de la richesse dans leur propre euh, euh, pays et territoire. Et c'est sur cet aspect-là que nous essayons de travailler davantage dans le futur. Il nous reste beaucoup de travail, vous l'avez bien dit. Thank you, Edouard. Which of the so three are you going to take a look at? I'm going to take my two minutes for the three of them, <laughs> but, but I'll be okay. really quick. Good luck. Uh, regarding gender, uh, I don't know if you've seen, but I expressed frustration when you mentioned the issue. It was not against you, but against how we approach the topic to date. When you prepare a project proposal, you have a criteria for gender, and you have how the question, how do you involve women in your project, and that's it. Uh, I believe that until uh, now it was a problem. Uh, I believe SDGs kind of uh, helped to bring the gap. Now you have a link that wasn't existing before between, for instance, access to water and uh, girls that are in class, okay? Uh, meaning that if you do improve the first, you do improve the second. Uh, that was for gender. For data, uh, we are on an, in an era in Africa on water quantity issue. And we are working with our partners so that they don't wait to get big industries, black and orange rivers, as we did in Europe back in the 60s and 70s, to actually act on quality and try to get some data on quality. And finally, on how to invest, um, of course there is development aid, and we've mentioned with incubation how we want to try and help our partners uh, access that but please understand that we also need to grab some of this money that goes into informal economy, into the formal economy. We need a fiscal system because what goes into the informal economy doesn't go to your Ministry of Health, Education and Water. Thank you. Thank you. Sonia? Uh, bonjour, je vais répondre en français à la question du Gabon sur l'échange de les, les questions de données. Effectivement, la qualité de l'eau, c'est un, un grand problème uh, dans beaucoup de parties du monde, et notamment maintenant aussi en Afrique. Et il y a quelques sources de données, par exemple par le programme des Nations Unies pour l'environnement, par le GEF, par aussi la Banque mondiale et autres, et aussi nous, des nouvelles méthodes qui se mettent en place avec les satellites et autres. Mais c'est encore insuffisant et il faut justement, comme on vient de dire, des investissements. Et dans les bassins partagés, le, le défi est encore plus grand parce qu'il faut euh, échanger les données, euh, il faut se mettre d'accord Analyse, faire des analyses conjointes, etc. Et c'est ça qui me ramène à la Convention sur l'eau. La Convention sur l'eau, en fait, a une très forte composante. Pas seulement elle oblige les États à prévenir les impacts, mais aussi à évaluer la qualité de l'eau et à échanger de la donnée et faire des évaluations communes, etc. Et c'est pour ça que... Et ça, c'est aussi une des, des, des grandes priorités de travail de la Convention dans les, dans les années à venir. Et comme Monica vient de dire, en fait, euh, c'est très encourageant de voir que beaucoup de pays, notamment en Afrique, s'intéressent à la Convention. Euh, et nous espérons que d'autres encore vont le faire et que aussi des processus d'adhésion dans les pays, euh, comme le Tchad ou le Sénégal qui l'ont fait, soient utilisés aussi comme un, une occasion pour justement, au niveau national, euh, aussi accroître euh, la visibilité, l'importance, la priorisation donnée euh, à toutes les questions qui concernent la qualité et l'information. Thank you. And over to you, Abdel. Et Which of the three topics are you going to take a quick look at? La qualité, comme je sais directement, évidemment, le disait, la, la question du représentant du Gabon par rapport à la qualité de, et la, les données pour faire la planification. Et je dirais qu'une des activités et les plus anciennes de la BN, c'est pratiquement la collecte de données. Et la BN fait partie aujourd'hui des rares bassins où vous avez un réseau et de à peu près 115 stations régulièrement suivies au niveau de l'hydrologie et neuf bases de données au niveau de chaque pays et une base de données régionale accessible à l'ensemble des États. Les chaînes d'information, elle est déjà là. La qualité de données, nous y avons pensé. Et l'état de lieu du bassin a été fait depuis 2005. Et suite à ça, nous avons fait une identification des réseaux de suivi de la qualité. Et ce réseau est un réseau minimum sur les points chauds, comme on l'appelle, ou là où la pollution, les indices de pollution ont été déjà suivis. Et globalement, le bassin, le bassin se porte bien, à l'exception évidemment de certains points chauds, à l'appelant à l'aval des grandes villes. 
euh, au niveau des, des zones des, des minières, ainsi de suite, nous les avons identifiées. Et nous disons que euh, la, la modélisation aujourd'hui, toutes les planifications que nous faisons, ce sont les modèles d'allocation et de gestion, d'abord, et le mec Bézin, que les hydrologues connaissent bien, et, et qui permet, évidemment, qui rassure les États, assure la compatibilité des investissements planifiés. Est-ce que tous les ouvrages qui sont planifiés, est-ce qu'il y a de l'eau pour permettre de faire tout ce qu'on a dit de faire, tout ce qu'on veut faire C'est ce modèle qui nous dit, et non, vous ne pouvez pas, c'est bon d'avoir des ambitions, mais si vous le faites dans cette point, Donc, la qualité de données, nous avons les perspectives, tous les projets qui démarrent, le projet de, de, comment dirais-je, avec la BAD, il y a au moins 10 millions de dollars pour renforcer l'observatoire du bassin du Niger qui fait la veille en termes de qualité, en termes évidemment d qui suit les impacts sociaux. Abdel, this Donc, may be a great moment to segue over to Ousman to yes. close us out because we've got people in front of the door okay, waiting for the next session. Okay, c'est pour assurer évidemment notre ami que évidemment nous travaillons et que et les, la charte de l'eau avec ses annexes sur l'environnement réglemente et fixe évidemment tout ce qu'il y a lieu de faire pour préserver l'environnement du bassin et la qualité de l'eau au niveau du bassin. Merci. Thank you very much. I will address myself to the two points on gender and jobs for youth. Um, at the African Development Bank, we have gone beyond just saying we have involved or consulted so many women. We have got a gender marker that we are rolling out. And with this gender marker, we are mainstreaming gender in all our infrastructure uh, uh, projects. So it's about how many women are empowered, how many jobs, and not just jobs, what quality of jobs have been created for women. For example, if you are doing a road and there's a community where women are selling their products in dangerous uh, places, you put up a market to ensure that they are trading in a safe place and they are empowered. If you are doing a water uh, pipeline to a city, there are women in a village that have no access to water. You provide for them water supply and empowering, true empowerment, not just 30% of the committee should be women, not just 80% uh, of the women were empowered. We are moving towards true empowerment, both of the women and the youths. We have a program that we call Jobs for Youths at the bank, and we are rolling this out. The Sahel is one of the main focus areas because we understand, we appreciate uh, 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 the challenges that the youths are facing there. And we are rolling out programs where we are deliberately empowering young people, we are empowering women to have jobs that can sustain their livelihoods, that to make them stay on the continent and not take up dangerous uh, uh, voyages into, into Europe through the desert and the Mediterranean. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming, sharing in the dialogue. These are very, very difficult topics. I am grateful that the Africa Development Bank has hosted us for this one. Um, everybody's going to stay around here. Um, you can find out a little bit more about the publication, also about the NAP planning tools. Um, and we welcome you to a number of other conversations that are happening in the next couple of days, also together with the Global Water Partnership. Thank you all for coming. Let me take this opportunity to invite you all for a snack outside. Please don't oh, just rush. Snack is pick, always good. pick a bite. Snack is always good. <laughs>